Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third session of the Sarabhai online lecture series. Today, we have with us Dr. Sudeep Bhattacharya, who will be talking about the exotic world of neutron stars. Dr. Sudeep is a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at TIFR, his main research area being neutron stars and black holes. He also holds the responsibility of payload manager of soft X-ray telescope AstroSat space mission, responsible for India's first dedicated astronomy satellite. He has got more than 70 papers published, with his main research topics being properties and evolution of millisecond pulses and continuous gravitational radiation from them, extreme aspects of neutron stars and black holes using X-ray satellite data, numerical computation of rapidly spinning neutron star structures, study of tilted inner accretion disks, naked singularities and black holes, etc. We are honored to have you here, sir, and I would like to extend a warm welcome and humble... Uh, uh, we are really humbled to have you here, sir. I would also like to welcome all the participants who have joined in and made this event possible. Welcome one and all. I request our HOD ma'am, DV Shah ma'am, to speak a few words before we start with the event. Greetings. On the behalf of the department, I welcome Professor Sudip Bhattacharya to this third talk of Sarabhai online lecture series. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation and agreeing upon to give a talk on the exotic world of uh, neutron stars. It will include the exciting topics of their existence and life on Earth. Uh, sir, the lecture series surely will enrich the students with uh, knowledge as the eminent speakers come from different walks of life. I hope everyone is well aware of the theme concerning the lecture series. Uh, we have a great time having you all and our eminent speakers engaging more people onto a greater level. I feel great proud to say that our students are actively engaged in such activities and have chronically gained the success in each event. So thank you. Thank you once and all. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting the invitation, sir. Over to you, sir. You can proceed with Thank the you. Talk. Thank you very much. I will first share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. yes sir. All right. Good evening. Yes. Thanks to all. Thanks to the organizer and thanks to the um, uh, HOD for inviting me to deliver this lecture. I asked about the audience. And I was told that a majority of the audience would be from physics undergraduate. And uh, some of them would have engineering background. And uh, generally or typically, people would not have uh, an astronomy background, but they are very interested. So keeping these in mind, I have designed my talk in the following way, of course, I will talk about neutron stars, their importance, their diversity, how they can uh, uh, be very important for our existence, how they can even destroy us. But I will also briefly talk about astronomy, our universe, and the objects of the universe to give a brief background or put the neutron star into context. The other thing is that the talk will be mostly in the very popular level, but still, since there are physics and engineering students, I will uh, put some uh, slides which will have some very moderate uh, physics aspects. So let me start the exotic world of neutron stars. What is a neutron star? This is a neutron star, this black circle in comparison to a city. And this is a city. This happens to be the city of, city of Chicago. And this is Lake Michigan. One can see that neutron star has more mass than our sun. But their radius is about 10 to 15 kilometer. That's why they can be fitted within a city limit. And that's why their density is extremely large. The core density of a neutron star is 5 to 10 times the nuclear density, which means all the nuclei 
we know about atomic structure we know that within atom there is a very small nucleus but very massive and around that the electrons are uh, rotating so all the nuclei are merged together under great pressure and the entire star with its about 10 to the power 57 nucleons that is protons and neutrons is a giant nucleus itself and the magnetic field of the star can be from 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power 15 gauss to put it into context i would remind that the magnetic field of our earth is between 0.3 to 0.6 gauss and the maximum magnetic field we can so far produce in the laboratory is of the order of a few times 10 to the power 5 gauss and that magnetic field also not stable we can um, perhaps produce it for a short time and this is a stable magnetic field the lowest possible field is 10 to the power 7 gauss while the highest is enormous unthinkable 10 to the power 15 gauss and there are there is a fraction of neutron stars which can spin around their own axis several hundred times just in one second so these are called millisecond pulses so this a neutron star can be thought to be a very extreme object but not all neutron stars so you can see that neutron star can have a although all neutron stars are very extreme they can have a range of properties so all neutron stars are not same so some of them for example can have magnetic steel a little moderate although by our standard it's very high in 10 to the power 7 gauss while others can be truly uh, very extreme 10 to the power 15 gauss and typically the neutron stars with lower magnetic field can uh, may, may can spin very fast for example several hundred times within one second but the neutron stars which have a very high magnetic field typically they spin very at a lower rate for example once in a second or something like that and there is a reason for that and i am mentioning it because there are physics students so neutron star is a kind of dipole magnetic dipole and when it spins around its own axis it emits electromagnetic radiation particularly dipolar radiation and that radiation energy is proportional to the magnetic field square and spin frequency to the power four so when you have both the magnetic field and spin frequency both are very high then it radiates enormously and very quickly it spins down that is why the neutron stars with higher magnetic field they spin slower that their spin rate is really relatively slow while uh, uh, the, uh, the neutron stars with relatively smaller magnetic field they can spin faster so here is a little bit of physics and uh, i have told about the extreme aspects of some of the extreme aspects of neutron stars and there is only one known object in the universe which is more extreme than neutron star and that is a black hole but if for a black hole the entire mass is hidden within an invisible surface invisible boundary it's called event horizon and therefore we cannot see the matter so neutron star is the densest and most extreme object known object of the universe which has a hard surface which we can see all right so this is some preliminary these are some preliminaries about neutron stars and then as i promised i will take you through a very quick journey i'll start from so our solar system and i will go up to our universe a very brief overview of our universe and its objects so let's start from our solar system we all know about solar system most people know that there is the sun which holds almost all the mass of the solar system and there are eight planets moving around uh, the sun and also there are other objects for example dwarf planets so 
So most uh, well-known dwarf planet is Pluto, but there are other dwarf planets such as, for example, Ceres, which is in this asteroid belt between the orbits of uh, Mars and Jupiter. And uh, uh, there are other objects as well. For example, beyond the orbit of Neptune, there is this Kuiper belt. This Kuiper belt and another belt far from the sun, which is called Oort cloud, they give rise to various kinds of objects, for example, comets. And there are other objects in the uh, solar system as well, which are far from the sun. And they are uh, rotating around, the, orbiting around the sun with a very large orbit. And the entire solar system is filled by the solar wind. This is called heliosphere. Sun, it is the sphere of the sun. It is the sphere of influence of the sun. It's filled with uh, solar wind. So this is our solar system, which is really a minuscule thing in the universe. I go to the next bigger object, our galaxy. So there are typically two kinds of galaxies. One is a, uh, one is a kind of ellipsoid or spheroid-like galaxy. It's a kind of round type galaxy. Another is a spiral galaxy. Our galaxy is a spiral galaxy. In the spiral galaxy, there is a disk and at the center, there is a bulge made of stars and gas, etc. And the disk has two spiral arms. That's why this kind of galaxies are called spiral galaxies and from the center our sun or solar system is 8 kiloparsec away one parsec is 3.26 light years and one light year is that length which light takes uh, 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 travels in one year so entire diameter of our galaxy is about 100000 light years so you can imagine how big it is because light takes, in one second, light can round our earth more than seven times. And light takes 100,000 years to cross our galaxy. And uh, our solar system is about 30,000 uh, light per, uh, year away from the center of our galaxy. And there are various objects, of course, in our galaxy. Uh, uh, there are globular clusters, there are nebula, there are other things gas dust various kinds of stars i am not going into it and next bigger object is a cluster of galaxies so for example here is an example this particular cluster of galaxy hcg87 400 million light years away from us this galaxy cluster has three galaxies in it at least three galaxies at least seen here two spiral galaxy here here and here they are bound together that's why we call the galaxy cluster because their galaxies are gravitationally bound. And other objects like this spiral galaxy is a distant galaxy, not part of this cluster. Now let me go to the next bigger structure of the universe, which is the large scale structure of the universe. And you can see there are enormous giant voids here there, where there are hardly any mass, hardly any matter. And all matter are in this filamentary structure. Here, each node is a perhaps a cluster of galaxy. Each point here is a galaxy. So you can imagine how big it, this large scale structure is, and this is only a section of that. So this is the large scale structure of our universe. And let me now go to the universe itself. You must have heard that our universe is expanding like this balloon. So here, the three dimensional space of the universe has to be compared with the two dimensional surface of the balloon. And on the surface of the balloon, there are spots. Each spot is a galaxy. As the balloon is expanding, all galaxies are moving away from each other. So that's what is, that's what is happen, happening in our universe. It is expanding. The other thing is that most part of the universe is unknown. The atoms we know, the baryonic matter, the uh, protons, neutrons, etc., or even leptons, electrons, they consist at most 5% of the mass of our universe. About 24-25% mass are dark matter, which we can detect 
through their gravitational effect, but we cannot see them and we do not know what they are. And more than 70% of the mass or energy of the universe is in mysterious dark energy, which is responsible for an accelerating expansion of the universe. So universe, we believe that started from a point and by a super explosion called Big Bang. And since then it is expanding. But we would expect that as the time passes, the rate of expansion would decelerate, would decrease. But in current time, it is increasing. It is accelerating. Expansion rate is accelerating, increasing. So that is happening because of this dark energy component, which uh, uh, occupies 70%, more than 70% of the mass of the universe. So you see that more than 95% mass of the universe, content of the universe, we do not know anything about. We know only a little bit about our rest 4 to 5 percent of the universe, which we think are made of proton, neutrons, quarks, etc., or atoms. So these are all about this is a quick journey from solar system to uh, universe. Now let me come back to neutron stars. Now, neutron star is a star, basically, it's a stellar end product. So it is born from a star. And stars are born in a nebula, a gas cloud. And here is this beautiful picture, beautiful image of the horsehead nebula. It looks like horsehead, that's why it's called horsehead nebula. And some parts are dark because there is radiation is absorbed there, and some parts are bright because uh, that those portions are emitting. So this is a beautiful nebula. There are many such very beautiful nebulae. And this is the life cycle of stars. Life cycle of stars is basically same as life cycle of matter in our galaxy or other galaxies, basically in our universe. So stars are born, whether it's a high mass star or low mass star, they are born in a nebula. It's a gas cloud. When the gas cloud is collapsed, then the star is born. And it starts, the nuclear fusion starts within it, and it starts emitting light. So there can be various stars of various masses. So there can be smaller stars, there can be bigger stars. A smaller star, like our sun-like star, when its fuel is exhausted, mostly exhausted, then its core collapses, and the rest of the material expands, and it becomes a red giant. And eventually, core collapses enough, and it gives a, a lot of energy, and the outer part is expelled, and this outer part becomes a nebula like this called planetary nebula. And here is the core. A core becomes a white dwarf. So white dwarf, its uh, size is of the or order of our Earth, but mass is of the order of Sun. And eventually, white dwarf radiates away its energy and becomes a black dwarf. It disappears. For high mass stars, it's more exciting. These huge stars or giant stars, when they very rapidly exhaust their, uh, uh, burn their material, they become red supergiant. And eventually, because they are more massive, more powerful, the core collapses, depending on the mass, either to a neutron star or to a black hole. And the rest of the part is expelled by a violent explosion called supernova. And these stars, within these stars, heavier elements are created. And those heavier elements, some of them at least, a part of them, are released by the supernova explosion. When the universe was created, apart from hydrogen and helium, very little heavier elements were created. But most heavier elements, which we see in our earth or around, in our body, and which we need for our existence, they were actually, we people used to believe they were created in, they are created in supernova, they are created in heavy, heavy stars and are released by supernova. And from this supernova ash, next generation of stars are, are created. This supernova ash is mixed up again in the nebula, stellar nursery. So heavier elements are mixed in the stellar nursery, the nebula, and then gas cloud collapses again and creates the next generation star. That's how this is the life cycle of stars and life cycles of matter 
through which heavier elements are created and through which we, because of which we can exist because we need heavier elements now this was the general view but people think that most of the very heavy elements like gold platinum etc they cannot be created in uh, these heavy stars or they cannot be released in supernova or created by supernova for that something else is needed already supernova create supernova is uh, related to the creation of the neutron star so neutron star is already uh, uh, was thought to be very critical for our existence but it is actually more critical than that so neutron star is a dead star there is no uh, uh, fuel in it there is no nuclear uh, almost no nuclear reaction is going on it's a dead star but life came from this dead star neutron star and that is by the merger of two neutron stars and the first merger of two neutron star was detected only a few years ago it particularly was detected on 17th august on 2017 so that's the first time the merger of two neutron star was detected through gravitational waves and through electromagnetic waves i i'll come to that but when two neutron stars merge very heavy elements and lot of other heavier elements are created for example the gold ring or gold chain you wear that gold perhaps came from the merger of two neutron stars most of the elements of our body or of our earth possibly came from the fire of the merger of two neutron stars in this extremely high energy heavier elements are created and released so neutron star merger released gold and other heavier elements we owe our existence to neutron star mergers and hence to neutron stars so that's why neutron stars are so important and also such a merger can create a ripple in space time which is called gravitational wave now what is meant by ripple in space time space is space as we feel and time is also time we know it very well but what is the ripple in space time so i come to a little bit of physics here again so we all know about newton's law of gravitation so that's the first law of gravitation given that is uh, that gives the force between two massive bodies m1 and m2 and the force is m1 into m2 divided by r square r is the distance between them and there is a universal gravitational constant g so two massive bodies interact via force and that's how they move that's how uh, planets move around star etc but then this this theory was given in the later part of 17th century but in early part of 20th century 1905 einstein gave a new theory called special theory of relativity in which the space and times were merged they were related to each other they were not independent of each other there's a special theory of relativity but that did not include yet the effect of gravitation then after 10 years in 1915 einstein gave a more general theory which is called general theory of relativity which basically says the concept or philosophy is like that that space time is not a mere background it's a, it's it, not only they are related to each other according to special theory of relativity but they are also some kind of object they can respond to the motion of the objects or the influence of the object so for example if there is a massive body that can bend the space time like this space time can bend so suppose you have a uh, an a handkerchief and you hold all four corners of it tightly and it is uh, almost horizontal now you put a ball into on it and then the middle of it will dip because of the massive ball similarly the space time when there is no massive body it is flat but if there is a massive body it bends the space time and because it's bends the space time other objects 
moves accordingly through this bend. For example, your handkerchief, you have put a massive body on it and it dips in the middle. Now, if you put a very light mass at the corner of the handkerchief, it will move towards the middle, towards the heavier mass. Similarly, uh, uh, sun, for example, is a massive body. It bends the space time around it. And therefore, lighter planets, they, ha they have to move along this bent of the space time, along this curved space time. That's how they move around the sun. And also because the space time is bent, the path of light can, can also bend when it passes very close to a massive body. For example, from this object, light is coming towards us, but there is a massive body in between and which has been the space time like this and therefore the path of the um, uh, light has to bend and it instead of moving this way it moves this way now it part has been carved and therefore when we see this object we see it in this direction not here but here all right this is the uh, preliminaries of uh, uh, relativity gen special and general relativities uh, we um, uh, and basically to learn uh, we have to learn here that the space time can be bent space time can be carved and therefore space time can also have ripples in it waves in it for example if this body moves in a certain way then that can create a ripple or wave in the space time and that wave is called gravitation wave and that we can see when two neutron stars merge we see gravitation we can detect gravitation waves all right. So now with this preliminaries, let's see why neutron star is so important to understand the physics of the universe, to understand the science of the universe, how the universe work, or the basic theories, basic laws of the universe. Why neutron stars are very important to understand these. Neutron star is a very unique natural laboratory. Many mysteries of the extreme environments of the universe are hidden in neutron stars. We cannot understand these mysteries. We cannot understand these aspects of the universe by doing experiments in laboratories. For that, we have to observe neutron stars. So again, a little bit of physics here. So you see that I have already explained the, that space time can be carved. So here is a plot. So uh, here is a plot which gives the strength of the gravity of various cosmic objects. So look at the two axes of the plot. The x-axis is gm by r. So m is the mass of the object, r is a typical distance, size of the object. So this is a measure of gravitational potential. As you know, the gravitational force is gm by r squared by Newton's law. And this is the gravitational potential. So higher the potential, more is the gravity. So uh, this is a one measure of gravity. Along y-axis, there is gm by r cube. I am not explaining why, but this is a measure of the space-time curvature according to the Einstein's theory of general theory of relativity. So both axes gives the strength of the gravity, one according Newton's law the gravitational potential another gives this according to the einstein's theory that is the space time curvature so we are we have taken both and remember uh, you notice that both both axes are in logarithmic scale which means here 10 to the power minus 15 you go one tick you have increased it five orders of magnitude here also same you go one tick you have increased the value five orders of magnitude that is by 100000 by one tick you are increasing the value by 100000 so now with this introduction, let me show you that the position of Earth in this plot is here. So Earth has some moderate gravity. Here is a main sequence star, that is our sun. Here is a white dwarf, as I have already mentioned. The, this is our solar system. Here is our galaxy, it is called Milky Way galaxy, MW is Milky Way. From the outer edge of the galaxy, as we go inside, its gravity, gravity increases. So at the center, there is a very supermassive black hole. And therefore, the gravity is very high at the center of the galaxy. 
but you see that here is the neutron star and here here are the smaller black holes these are called stellar mass black hole but let's consider neutron star here is the neutron star you can see that neutron star give rise to by far the strongest gravity of the universe at least our known universe so neutron star is such an extreme object we consider all the objects of the universe and neutron star has by far the strongest gravity and again remember one tick you move up you are increasing the value by 100000 so it's by far the strongest gravity therefore neutron star can be very useful to test a theory of gravitation like our uh, general theory of relativity in the extremely strong gravity and to understand various aspects of the universe in a very extreme condition so that's why we need to study neutron stars and then look at the structure of a neutron star. So here is the structure of a neutron star is a slice of the neutron star from center to the surface. So there is hardly any branch of physics which is not useful to study neutron star. For example, consider the crust of the neutron star. It's already the density is uh, uh, a million uh, gram per centimeter cube, million gram per cc even at the outer crust so this is important to study for example solid state physics so neutron star crust is the strongest known solid in the universe one study has shown that neutron star crust is about 10 billion times stronger than steel but crust is only uh, the least exotic part of the neutron star of course neutron star is an it is a cosmic object therefore astrophysics is important for to study neutron star gravitation it's a strong gravity object so gravitational physics is important the nuclear physics is important here where when you go from outer crust to inner crust density is so large that electrons and protons combine within the nucleus and they become neutron and there are so many neutrons in the nucleus that the nucleus become unstable so neutrons drip out from the nucleus so in the in the inner crust you will find a lot of neutrons which are uh, moving around so instead of electrons although electrons will also be there but there are more neutrons there there would be a neutron gas here so nuclear physics is very important you go to the core here in the outer core it, already here you have reached the nuclear density so when you go inside it's more than nuclear density so many nuclei are merged fused together and this is the realm of particle physics or high energy physics where you will find there's a superfluid new, neutrons and some superfluid protons and there are all many nuclei which are merged with each other and then you go to the innermost part of the neutron star we do not know what is there the density is very high we cannot find out by any experiment in laboratory because it's a cold matter it's a so-called degenerate matter that temperature is relatively low compared to the density so uh, we, we do not know and that is one of the mysteries of particle physics which we, we want to understand by studying neutron stars so again this is the core we do not know where it is uh, what is there the entire neutron star could be a bag of quarks so let me tell you that you, you must have heard about protons and neutrons which are constitu constituents of nucleus now in each proton there are three quarks a proton is made of three quarks similarly neutron is also made of three quarks so quarks are the basic elements of nu nucleons that is protons and neutrons but it may be possible the density is so high pressure is so high at the core that quarks become free and there may be a ball of 10 to the power 57 free quarks there which is 
extremely exotic but we do not know these are all our uh, models our guess but actually what is there we need to find that by observing neutron stars and measuring their various properties so this is a fundamental problem of particle physics now let me uh, move to the observation and consider observational windows so we know that we use window to look outside and for thousands of years we had only one window that is visible light which we can directly detect by our eyes but since the 19th century we know that visible light is only a small part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum which spans from radio to gamma rays and is the same kind of uh, <coughs> electromagnetic uh, oscillation or radiation only differs in wavelength in radio the wavelength may be as large as the size of a building infrared it could be as small as the uh, point of a needle visible light the wavelength may be the size of a cell human cell for ultraviolet molecules for x-ray may be size of atoms and for gamma rays the size of the wavelength may be of the uh, size of the atomic nucleus so it is, this is the entire electromagnetic spectrum and we want to observe the universe to the entire spectrum because neutron stars emit in all wavelengths but we cannot we cannot detect all the the entire electromagnetic spectrum coming from a cosmic source on earth so we can see radio this this range of radio very well because it the atmosphere is entirely transparent and the entire radio wave from a cosmic source can come here so we have built our radio telescope on earth but then this portion of the radio we cannot detect because the ionosphere stops them similarly if we consider here ultraviolet x ray and gamma ray, gamma ray we cannot detect them at all because I, I, the atmosphere stops them it's good for us because if uh, the cosmic ultraviolet x rays and gamma rays would reach us then we would not exist so uh, uh, we we have to send our instruments detectors or telescopes above the atmosphere to observe the x rays ultraviolet or gamma rays so either by balloon or by satellite and visible light mostly come to us but a small portion maybe 10 percent of it is absorbed by the atmosphere now why do we want to observe the universe in uh, through the entire electromagnetic spectrum see that this is our universe as we see them uh, basically if we look at the sky in various wavelengths from radio infrared optical x-ray gamma ray they would look like this and this this line here this strip here is basically our galactic plane so there are many objects there this is our uh, galactic plane you can here you can see very uh, <laughs> clearly the uh, our galactic bulge ours is a spiral galaxy as i said it has a bulge and a, a, a disk we can see both the disk and the bulge very clearly in infrared but in various wavelengths the sky look very different because there are many kinds of objects which emit in various wavelengths in different ways so with various wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation we see various kinds of objects and various kinds of physics as well for example look at the sun there are four uh, images of sun here radio infrared optical and x-ray you see that they are they look so different particularly x-ray compare infrared and x-ray the infrared is basically is heat basically heat it comes from the surface of the photosphere of the sun it's surface of the sun so we see the very distinct uh, surface solar disk but x-rays do not come from the surface of the sun they come from outside the sun a very thin gas is there that is called corona very <coughs> hot and thin gas that is called corona the physics is also different this infrared emission is basically powered by the nuclear fusion that is happening at the center of sun here 
the x rays are more directly powered by the reconnection of magnetic fields so in the corona magnetic fields there uh, field lines are opened up and reconnected and that gives out enormous amount of energy which come out in x rays so we can see this corona when there is a total solar eclipse so you see that with the main point is with various wavelengths of electromagnetic spectrum we can see different objects we can see we can probe various kinds of physics so we must observe our universe in the entire electromagnetic spectrum from radio to gamma ray so that's the reason we try to observe uh, in various uh, wavelengths so neutron stars are observed in wide range of electromagnetic wavelengths from radio to gamma rays but they are they were discovered in radio wavelengths so uh, let me quickly go through the discovery of uh, neutron stars this is the kind of timeline in 1932 the neutron was detected uh, neutron was discovered by chadwick and next year in 1933 these two people they proposed that with the known supernova observe supernova there must be a, a star must be related to it which is called neutron star which could be the end product of stars so which could be made of entirely neutrons so that's the first time neutron star was theoretically proposed and then around the same time in early 1930s the <coughs> indian astronomer astrophysicist uh, subramaniam chandrasekhar he proposed a celebrated limit which says that uh, which basically determines the maximum mass of a white dwarf which is about 1.4 solar mass if the mass is more than that then it will go on collapsing and nobody knows what would happen to that so the nobody that time believed that there could be a black hole uh, <clears throat> for example the celebrated uh, and uh, scientist albert einstein didn't believe that and and uh, very famous astronomer and uh, chandrasekhar supervisor eddington also did not believe that so chandrasekhar uh, uh, nobody believed chandrasekhar at that time but uh, that came out to be true later i am not going into uh, details but he gave this upper limit of white mass of the white dwarf in which the gravity of the white dwarf is balanced by the so called degeneracy pressure of electrons now towards the end of 1930s these people proposed that suppose there are instead of electrons there are neutrons then the degeneracy pressure will be higher and it can possibly support more mass and that would create a star different from white dwarfs that would be neutron stars so that is another theoretical first theoretical calculation of the structure of neutron star so that was a theoretical proposal and this was a theoretical calculation but then the second world war started and the so the scientific research essentially decreased or stopped almost but second world war has a very positive effect also that because people developed radars for the purpose of war the radio astronomy also developed <clears throat> so so far till the middle of last century there was only optical astronomy the people relied only on visible lights but now radio astronomy was also developed and through radio astronomy so radio observation these people particularly the student joseline bell barnell she and her supervisor anthony hewish discovered the first neutron star in radios what they found they found basically a very regular pulse very regular pulses in radios they were so regular that they appeared to be man made so when they th uh, found that they were not man made they thought and other people also thought that they were from some distant civilization so that's how the theory of little gray, green men came out so but then they found similar pulses from various directions now it is almost impossible that people people from various civilizations from various directions far from each other they would try to contact us with the same radio waves at the same time 
so they must be natural so the um, explanation was this came from a neutron star which has this this is a neutron star and it says dipolar magnetosphere magnetic field lines like a bar magnet the neutron star is like a bar magnet and there are some open field lines along which great energy and lot of particles come out and that gives rise to this pulse why pulse why not constantly they are giving out because they are coming out constantly but neutron star is spinning around its own axis suppose the observer is in this direction but this beam is rotating around the spin axis as the neutron star is rotating spinning this beam is also rotating so it's a lighthouse it's like a torch light which is moving around rotating so when this beam is towards us we can see the pulse other time we cannot so that's how we see the radio pulses from neutron stars and that's how they are they were detected but th this was in 1967 but even five years before that neutron stars were already discovered in x-rays in 1962 only thing that it was not realized that the object was neutron star so that was by uh, 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 ricardo giacconi uh, who sent so that was the beginning of uh, extra astronomy as well so after the second world war various uh, branches of astronomy came out like x-ray astronomy gamma ray astronomy radio astronomy infrared astronomy etc so this was the beginning of radio astronomy uh, beginning of x-ray astronomy he sent a small x-ray detector on a um, sounding rocket it's a suborbital rocket and he discovered an extrasolar X-ray source. Extrasolar X-ray source. So uh, this source was actually neutron star in a binary system, and the neutron star, the matter from the uh, companion star, is falling onto the neutron star, and this matter when it is falling onto the neutron star it emits x-rays that's how we observe x-rays now um, it's almost six and it is delayed and i have many slides so please let me know that how much time i have uh sir uh, you can continue for 15 minutes sir all right yeah yes, sir. so now as i said that <clears throat> x-rays cannot come to us on the surface of the earth they are absorbed by atmosphere so we need to send the x-ray instrument or telescope or detector above the atmosphere so this can be sent like a suborbital rocket like this but that lasts only a few minutes we can also send the instrument by a balloon which lasts only a few hours but if we send the instrument by a satellite then it can last for a few years satellite is the most stable platform but initially there are no satellites so in 1960s this discovery was made in 1962 and in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in TIFR, that is my institute, there was already this balloon facility program in Hyderabad and people realized that we can do this kind of research. So, that, so the first discovery and the beginning of extra astronomy was 1962 and immediately by 1965 or so we had a program x-ray astronomy program so it's very fast so almost simultaneously with the entire world the other parts of the uh, uh, developed world so it started and we started sending um, uh, x-ray instruments by via balloons but then people moved to satellite so first x-ray satellite was sent in 1970 by nasa and then we lagged behind because we didn't have any satellite program that time and these are the some of the satellites that 
came up by uh, NASA and ESA, European Space Agency. And here are some of the extra satellites that are working now. So some of them from uh, NASA and this is from ESA. Okay. But in India, people didn't give up. So soon after this, the satellite program started in India. The ISRO sent its second satellite on a Russian vehicle. The second satellite was Bhaskara, on which TIFR sent an X-ray sky monitor. So that was in 1979. By 1996, India was sending rockets, the launch vehicles. So, so India sent this. Uh, <coughs> this is another landmark. landmark. This IXA instrument was sent, but that was an instrument on a remote sensing satellite. The satellite was not dedicated for astronomical research. But then in 2015, the first dedicated Indian astronomy satellite, AstroSat, was sent. It has many instruments in X rays, UV, and optical. And that is still working, working very well. And this is a satellite which is particularly doing the studying neutron stars very well and many research papers are being published so here is the quick thing that uh, this is the astrosat satellite there before launch and this is the entire vehicle from housing it is going to the launch site and finally on 28 september 2015 it was launched from sriharikota and it was inserted on a um, <coughs> equatorial orbit um, about 650 kilometer above the earth. So this is about AstroSat, just to show you that in India also, we are doing a very active and frontline research on neutron stars and we have our own instruments and satellites. So now coming back to neutron star itself, neutron stars can have various incarnation. For example, this is, a, this is the famous crab pulsar. The neutron star is here, it's a point, we cannot resolve it. So this is basically a supernova remnant seen in observing X-rays. And it looks like this. It's a very uh, new uh, supernova remnant, only about 1,000 years old. So when this supernova exploded in 1054 C, then it was recorded by various civilizations, like the Chinese and Arabs recorded it. So this, this is crab pulsar is a very new supernova and now it's a moderately old pulsar this is called geminga pulsar it is about 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 6 years old so uh, 100000 to million years old and it has come out of its supernova the supernova remnant has this dispersed and it is now speeding through the, through our galaxy through the inter uh, 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 this is the interstellar medium through the interstellar medium it is speeding through and because it is speeding through and the particles and energies is coming out from it like a jet we can see various extensions all in x-rays and then there can be neutron stars which are in binary systems as i said this is only an artist's impression because we cannot image them they are so small so this is a neutron star here and this is a massive star that's why it's called high mass x-ray binary because this, this is a high mass star from the star matter is falling onto the neutron star and it is emitting x-rays so this is called high mass x-ray binary this is another incarnation of in, in neutron stars and then if the companion star is a low mass star then it's called low mass x-ray binary but the process is same the matter from the star is falling onto the neutron star and it is emitting x-rays so i will a little bit <coughs> focus on the low mass x-ray binaries in which from the companion star matter is falling via a disk onto the neutron star why via a disk why not directly matter is falling on the neutron star because the two stars is rotating around each other at a high speed and therefore this matter which is coming out has a large angular momentum 
and the physics students will know that the angular momentum is conserved so unless we get rid of the angular momentum it cannot go in so it moves in a circle and slowly by viscous dissipation it moves in via a disk and the inner part of the disk is very hot its temperature is of the order of a million degree kelvin and therefore it emits x rays so these are the systems which can be very useful to study the strong gravity extreme strong gravity of neutron stars i already mentioned the neutron stars are very important to study strong gravity and here is an example the disk goes very close to the uh, neutron star in the strong gravity region where it emits x rays so if we observe this x rays from its various features we can probe the strong gravity uh, regime and we can study the extreme aspects of physics and here is th th this kinds of disk can provide uh, objects can provide various tools but this is one tools this is one tool understanding the theory of gravitation nature gives us a very convenient tool and what is this tool see this matter this is the neutron star and this is the disk this is the disk in our part of the disk i show here and this matter is moving rotating around the neutron star and ultimately it's falling onto the neutron star now that then there is some iron also other heavier elements are there but iron is most abundant among the heavier elements so there is some iron that iron is also moving and there can be as you know from atomic physics there can be atomic transitions in various between various levels of an atom or ion and that gives some energy that energy comes out as a spectral line that is an intensity at a particular wavelength or frequency it's a narrow spectral line but you see there is something called doppler effect you see this picture doppler effect you must have read in school that is this is police car which is uh, uh, giving out some sirens the sound siren and this man this person to which the police car is approaching this person would hear it at a higher frequency because of the doppler effect while this person from whom the police car is moving away would hear it at a lower frequency similarly here the spectral line is created from the element which is moving around the neutron star this portion which is perhaps moving away from the observer the spectral line would be shifted at a lower frequency while this portion will be shifted at a higher frequency that's how the inter spectral line that is observed by the observer will be broadened like this this is a newtonian effect but there then there will be special relativistic effect i am not going into the details of it but that will create the beaming effect that will is a special relativistic boost which will uh, basically make the line asymmetric and then there will be general relativistic effect and all kinds of effects of physics which can be cleanly observed and finally we would expect to observe a line originally a narrow line will be observed like this a broad and asymmetric line and by measuring this broad and asymmetric line in, in x rays in x ray wavelength we can actually probe all these effects doppler effect special relativistic general relativistic effects and therefore we can probe the strong gravity regime around the neutron star so this is a tool just to give you an, some idea this is a tool we can use to study uh, uh, the strong gravity regime around the neutron stars which people is a uh, uh, topic of very frontline research and many people throughout the world are working on this and this particular aspect actually are motivating uh, the future satellites so another aspect is thermonuclear x-ray bursts so the matter falls onto the neutron star surface and it accumulates and then that matter burns via via th thermonuclear run away processes and that gives rise to this burst 
So you see that x axis is time if in second and y axis is x ray intensity. So x ray intensity is relatively small and then it goes up very sharply and then it slowly comes down. So this is the thermonuclear burst that happens onto the on the surface of the neutron star. Although it happens for a few seconds, this is very energetic. For example, the energy that comes out in 10 seconds during such a burst, sun takes more than a week to release the same energy. And these bursts is another tool to study not only the strong gravity regime of neutron stars, but, but, but also to measure the neutron star parameter values, the properties, mass, radius, etc., and hence to understand what is there at the core of a neutron star, which is a very fundamental problem of particle physics, as I mentioned. So just to show, just to show you that how the thermonuclear flames can spread onto the surface of a neutron star when the burst happens. And you see that neutron stars have many, many kinds of uh, manifestations and they are important for many reasons. And this is one example. We know about exoplanets, the planets outside our solar systems. So far, a few thousand, more than 4,000 uh, exoplanets have been confirmed. And these are very important because we live on a planet and we think that other uh, civilizations, other living beings should also live on a planet. So you want to pl find planets, Earth-like planets and so on. And the first exoplanets were found from a neutron star. So neutron star is very important. The first, first exoplanets in 1992 were confirmed around the neutron star. From this neutron star, ESRB 1257 plus 12, three planets were found. This is, of course, an artist's impression. <clears throat> then neutron star gave rise to give the birth of multi-messenger astronomy. I talked about observational windows. For thousands of years, we observed the universe through only visible light. Then we found this electromagnetic spectrum from uh, uh, radio to gamma rays. And all these radio, gamma ray, X-ray, infrared, all are observational windows. But these windows are all part of electromagnetic spectrum. But then gravitational waves, that is another completely different kinds of window, which is um, which are ripples on space time, as I mentioned. That window, those gravitational waves were first discovered in 2015 from the merger of two black holes. But then there was no associated electromagnetic radiation. We found, we detected only gravitational waves because two black holes, the black holes do not give away uh, electromagnetic radiation. But then after two years, I sh showed this picture earlier. This is the merger of two neutron stars. On 17th August of 2017, that is the red letter day of astronomy and science also, because this does not happen very uh, frequently. Another window, another, another uh, method of astronomy another branch of astronomy was established because from the merger of these two neutron stars we found both electromagnetic radiation and gravitational waves that's how we know that these two are neutron stars and that's how we know that they give rise to various heavier various heavier elements including gold and platinum and that is that marked the only only four years ago it happened it so it is we are extremely fortunate that it has happened in our time that uh, a new branch of astronomy has been uh, established it is the birth of multi-messenger astronomy multi-messenger means 
both electromagnetic radiation, the entire electromagnetic spectrum, and also another, another source of information that is gravitational waves. And this was possible only because of neutron stars. So that shows the importance of neutron star. So uh, I'll skip that and I'll come to the last topic. The thing is, I have explained that neutron star was crucial for our, ex our existence. Without them, there would not be much heavier elements and we would not exist. But now that we exist, can they directly affect us? After all, they are too far and they are too small. It's so only 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer wide and they are uh, thousands of light, um, at least many light years away, tens to thousands, hundreds to thousands light years away. So are they really important for us now, now that we exist? So I come to the last topic here, the magnetar. I said earlier, I showed earlier that the neutron star magnetic field can, neutron stars can have diverse, a wide range of magnetic field from 10 to the power 7 Gauss to 10 to the power 15 Gauss. So those neutron stars which have very high magnetic field between 10 to the power 13 to 10 to the power 15 Gauss, they are called magnetars. They are very extreme objects. And the, here is a cartoon, of course, this is an artist impression. But you can see these cracks here. So what happens? These magnetars give regular pulses. It's not very regular. They, are, uh, they show intermittent pulses in X-rays and gamma rays mostly, but also in our other wavelengths. So those pulses themselves are very uh, strong. They are more, much more intense, orders of magnitude intense than, more intense than sun. But still, they are not that intense. But once in a while, such magnetars give rise to extremely large, giant, huge flares, very high energy flares. And how that happened? We do not know. But we, we, we think that maybe this very strong magnetic field can fracture, can crack the crust of the neutron star. Remember, this crust is about 10 billion times stronger than steel. Still, it can be cracked. And then, like our tectonic plates of our uh, on our Earth, like our uh, continents, these are also continents. And they can move a little bit. And there can be, like earthquake, there can be magnetic quakes. And because of these magnetic quakes, these magnetic field lines can open up and then reconnect. And because of that, because these magnetic fields are extremely strong, huge amount of energy can come out. It's a really monstrous energy and I'll show the effect. So I'll show that this is one way that neutron star can directly affect us. There are other ways as well, but this is one, one example. So let me come to this. So this is very last part of the talk. So uh, most students in the audience would not remember it because they were possibly small children in 20, on 26 December of 2004. There was a huge earthquake in the Indonesia region, more than nine uh, in the Richter scale. And it created a huge tsunami that passed through the Indian Ocean. It hit the east coast of India, particularly affected and killed many people in Tamil Nadu. Actually, tsunami is not that. Tsunami is the Japanese word. Uh, of course, it means harbor wave. So it, it's not, tsunami is not that common in our part of the world that is India and in the Indian Ocean. It mostly happens in Pacific Ocean, the west coast of US and near Japan. Therefore, when this tsunami happened, most of the many Indians actually first, first time learned the word tsunami. 
So the energy connected to this earthquake was about 23,000 Hiroshima-like type atomic bombs. And whole world war was talking about it that time, and I remember it. But very people, very people, few people, apart from some scientists, noticed that on the very next day, 27 December 2004, there was another tsunami, this time a tsunami of radiation coming from a magnetar. It came from a magnetar. It started 50,000 years ago from the magnetar exploded 50,000 years ago when long ago, long before uh, <coughs> the human started their civilization. But coincidentally, it reached our earth, the radiation, tsunami of radiation reached our earth on the very next day. So radiation was mostly in gamma rays, but also in X-rays and other wavelengths. And we have gamma ray satellites in the orbit. And those satellites was, were not looking at this event because at this direction, because we didn't know that there would be this explosion. Still, the radiation was so strong that it passed through the structures of the satellite and it overwhelmed the instrument, the detectors. And all the satellites detected this phenomenon, although they were not looking towards this event. And then it hit our ionosphere, it affected our ionosphere and our communication system. But people did not notice much except as, uh, some scientists because uh, the whole world was talking about this tsunami at that time. And rightly so, because this tsunami killed many people, this caused us a little uh, inconvenience. But you look at the energy in 0.1 second, that is one tenth of the time of the second, of a, of a second, this magnetar giant flare released energy which sun emits in 150,000 years. So it's a huge explosion, huge explosion. And compared to this, this energy is really minuscule. It's nothing. And it, we are fortunate that this explosion happened on the other part, on the other side of the um, our galaxy, 50,000 light years away. If this happened within 10 light years from us, then it, it would severely damage our atmosphere and would possibly lead to a mass extinction because if ozone layers were gone, then I do not know how we would survive. So we see that we owe our existence to the neutron stars definitely. And it is quite possible that neutron stars not only can affect us, but they can destroy us at any time if such a magnetar explosion or it's related or maybe a supernova explosion happens very close to us, then that may end our civilization or that may end us. So that way, neutron stars are very directly relevant for us. And here I stop. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing presentation and the lecture, sir. And now some of our participants have questions that they would like to ask you. Uh, they have dropped those questions in the chat box. I'll uh, read out, read them out. Um, one minute. So, so would you read them out or would I read it? Yes, sir. Uh, the first question is by uh, 
I can see. So this. sorry, so happens, one minute. Right? Yes, sir. Uh, how do neutron stars counterbalance the effect of gravity? Okay, all right. Yeah. Yes, I can see the question. So yes, it's called neutron degeneracy pressure or degeneracy pressure of other particles if they exist. For example, they, there may not be only neutrons, there may be hyperions, there may be quarks, etc. The thing comes from a something called uh, Fermi Dirac statistics. So that if you have not read yet, then uh, the physics students would have to read at some point. So and there is something called uh, Pauli's explo exclusion principle, which means that uh, Due to, uh, due to the statistics, two particles cannot be in the same state. So therefore, if two particles try to come to the same, same state because of the very high density, because of the uh, very strong gravity, then they, can, they resist. Because by the fundamental law of physics, they cannot be in the same state, these kind of particles, which we call fermions, like uh, protons, neutrons, quarks, etc. So therefore they resist and that gives rise to a pressure which we call degeneracy pressure that actually uh, counters the gravitational uh, the, the gravity all right so uh, should yes, i go the next to question the questions next question yes you can it, read it so that it, uh, everyone can hear yes sir is the rippling of space-time curvature responsible for the formation of gravity and gravitational waves and what do we mean exactly by the rippling of space-time? So you see that ripple in the space-time is the gravitational wave. It is not causing gravitational wave. It is the gravitational wave. So in the Einstein's theory of gravity, there is no force. There is only space-time curvature. So the idea is, unlike other kinds of force, so you may know that there are four kinds of fundamental forces in nature, like strong force, weak force, electromagnetic force, and gravitational force. Now, other three kinds of forces can be screened. They, they are not far-reaching forces. But gravity is a far-reaching force. Is a far-reaching force. For example, although my body is very small, even I am affecting the motion of not only sun, also that motion of distant galaxies. The, the effect is extremely minuscule, but I'm doing it because gravity is not screened. So gravity is all pervading. Similarly, space time is all pervading. So Einstein thought of this new way. The both are all, par, par, all pervading, so they must be related in some way. So he proposed this theory in this way. The massive body creates gravity, the effect of gravity, which bends the space time and if the space time is bent, like if there is a, uh, so co consider the heel, it, it's not uh, horizontal. So therefore, water moves from the top part to the bottom part. Similarly, if the space time is bent, the smaller bodies has to move accordingly. So that, that's the way space time and gravity, they interact with each other. The source of gravity is a massive body, which bends the space time, space time, it, it, on, uh, uh, in turn, it acts back, it basically forces the, uh, a massive body to move in a certain way. So that, that, that's the idea. The next question is, can you please explain the concept of nuclear pasta? Well, it's nothing, it's a, just an exotic name, it's nothing. So basically in a gravity, gravity is so strong at the center of the neutron star, that our uh, uh, nucleus, etc., all are kind of uh, deform in such a way. Sometimes it looks like a pasta, and sometimes looks like a pizza, and so on. So it's an exotic name only. Next question by Gaurav Malhotra: What happens in space that the disturbance in electric and magnetic fields in space creates light from different colors in it? I'm not very sure what happens in the space that the disturbance in the electric and magnetic fields in space um, creates light and 
form different kerosene so uh, so uh, i'm not very sure about the question but electromagnetic waves are a different thing from gravitational wave it's not related to uh, space time uh, in that sense uh, except that it moves through space uh, th that's it so it's a, it's a, it's it's a basically ripple in electromagnetic field so gravitational wave is a ripple in space time electromagnetic wave is a ripple in electric and magnetic field that's it and, 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 and of course the color is yeah. the color is determined by the wavelength of the wave he's he's telling the same thing that which we usually believe colors of different wavelength wave it's said by gaurav malhotra i think he's uh, mentioning the same point as you did right now sir i will move on to the next question what are magnetars how are they created and what kind of effect do they have on space okay yes so as i mentioned that magnetars are very high magnetic field neutron star that's all so magnetic field can be in the range of 10 to the power 13 to 10 to the power 15 gauss to put into perspective our earth's magnetic field is only 0.3 to 0.6 gauss and they do, do not have a particular uh, effect on space because of their magnetic field but all neutron star uh, ha has a effect of space time because they are very dense object it's a very strongly gravitating object and therefore they spin the uh, they bend the space time they curve the space time so uh, that is the effect of all neutron stars not only magnetars and how they are created of course uh, <clears throat> they are created like other neutron stars so when when the uh, when the massive stars its fuel is exhausted mostly its core collapses the neutron star is created by by that uh, core collapse now uh, why some neutron stars are magnetars and some are not why such a variation of magnetic field uh, that of course a particular question is a technical question and for the magnetar we do not know that also very well uh, only thing is no, uh, we, we we are sure about that the the initial star has some magnetic field when and and there is a theory i am not going into the theory and that is a theory of magneto hydrodynamics that is when the plasma uh, uh, moves uh, it, the astrophysical pl plasma moves the magnetic field lines moves with it so therefore when the star collapses stellar core collapses the magnetic field lines also they also collapse and they becomes very dense and therefore they become very strong so magnetic flux increases so you can one can easily calculate suppose a sunlight star becomes smaller and becomes a white dwarf and becomes a earth like star the entire magnetic field of the sun is also condensed into the earth like volume its intensity will increase and therefore magnetic field with magnetic flux magnetic field will also increase so that's the basic reason but why some become magnetar and why some are not that creates some kinds of other process for example uh, it may be may depend on the so called magnetic dynamo process the magnetic dynamo is a process through which we we have our dynamo you may read it in your physics course so similarly in nature there is magnetic dynamo by which magnetic field is created so maybe this kind for some reason this in this kind of source the magnetic field is created it is enhanced so that's how uh, some neutron stars uh, have very high magnetic fields and they are called magnetars next question by harshini gadaria what can be the origin of magnetic fields associated with neutron stars uh, that i have just mentioned that when when it collapses every every object has magnetic field the stars are magnetic field but it is uh, relatively small so for example our sun has a magnetic field of 1 to 5 gauss but <clears throat> if the stellar core collapses then the magnetic field will also be uh, lines will also be condensed and then uh, the it, it will increase its uh, value or magnitude will increase next question by shreyan goswami is how is astrosat any different and what makes so it special astrosat uh, is very different uh, in a few ways for example it has it is an observatory which has 
many instruments. There are several X-ray instruments, optical, telescope, uh, UV telescopes, and therefore it can cover a very large ring, uh, range of wave band from optical to UV to soft X-ray to hard X-ray. So it is uh, very special that way. And in hard X-ray, uh, uh, there is an instrument called large X-ray proportional counters that is at present the largest, uh, uh, the biggest instrument in that, in that wavelength range at this time. And there are some other things as well. For example, it has UV telescope, which is much better than uh, some other UV telescopes in space. Its resolution much better. Then there, are, there is an, another uh, instrument in hard X-rays, which can also study the polarization in X-rays. It, 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 for the first time, it studied the polarization of, say, something called gamma ray burst, which is another kind of explosion in the universe. I'm not going into that. So there are many reasons that ASOSAT is very special. Next question by Aditya A. Rao. What is the possibility of having quark gluon plasma in the course of neutron stars? So uh, I, I do not know. Nobody knows. So uh, what is there at the core of a neutron star at a density, say 10 times higher than the nuclear density? We cannot, uh, we cannot find it by doing and a low temperature. So it's called degenerate uh, material. So it's uh, relatively low temperature. So we consider temperature is zero. Although the actual temperature is 10 to the power 8 to 9 degree Kelvin, we um, consider it zero because density is so large compared to that the effect of temperature is, uh, is uh, very small. So at, at that uh, very high density, what is the nature of matter? Which particle will be there? That is a that is the main question. That is the fundamental question of particle physics, and that problem is not yet solved. So there are many models. Uh, for example, it could be purely uh, quarks, or it could be some kinds of other particles like hyperions, or something called pion condensate, kaon condensate, etc. There are many 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 proposals, but it's not solved yet. Next question by Vinit Pandya. Can neutron stars play a role in discovery of the hypothetical particle graviton and how? So, uh, uh, so yes, neutron star mergers give rise to gravitational waves and therefore uh, it may be possible. Yes. So, so neutron star may play a role. Yes. Next question by Nihar Wankudre. How can we visualize the ripple in actual 3D space time? So uh, I guess that this is the question about gravitational wave that is ripple in space time. So ripple in space time measured by uh, some instrument. It's a huge instrument. Uh, you can, uh, uh, the, the, these are called interferometer, but interferometer not you uh, something you find find in your lab there are some in your lab you may find some interferometer like michelson uh, interferometer fabry perot interferometer those are for lights for uh, gravitational wave is the it, these interferometers work in the same principle but one arm of the interferometer each arm of the interferometer is 4 kilometers long so an entire 4 kilometer is completely vacuum so it's a huge state of the art uh, instrument because we need it because the strength of gravitational wave, the ripple in space time is extremely, extremely weak. So with all this, we finally measure some displace, uh, displacement of mass, some displacement of mass, some mass is hanging somewhere in the instrument, some displacement. And it, 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 it is displaced by a very, very, very small amount. And that displacement, the amount of that displacement is measured by some laser light using the uh, principle of this interferometer. So that, that's how uh, the ripple is uh, essentially measured. It's not directly measured. It's not directly uh, you see some kind of ripple in the space time. It's not like that. Uh, Basically, finally, you have you measure some displacement, and that displacement you measure 
by the uh, principle of interferometer using laser light. And the interferometer size is four kilometers. Uh, Sir Gaurav Malhotra is asking the question again. Uh, he, he says that he wants to know how the electric and magnetic field disturbances create such a phenomenon called visible light and it with uh, different wavelength components in it. So visible light is the electric and are the ripples of electric and magnetic fields. So it, uh, it it's uh, it, you can read if you are from physics, you will read it in your uh, course in electromagnetism. So this basically there are electric and magnetic fields and the ripples in this electric and magnetic fields is how the energy of the electromagnetic field propagates. And this energy is basically li the light we observe. And the, these ripples, the size of these ripples, the wavelength of these ripples determines whether the, it is a visible light or gamma ray or radio. So if the wavelength is very big, then it's radio. If it is extremely small, like an atomic nucleus, it, it will be gamma rays. But essentially, <coughs> elect, uh, it's basically when you see the light, some kind of light, you, you would know that some kind of energy has come to us, uh, come to you. For example, you see your uh, the wall in front of you, some kinds of energy from the wall has reached your eyes. So that um, uh, energy has come like a wave, like you uh, throw a stone in the pond and you see ripples and the ripples uh, spread, they go away. So when you throw the stone, you give some impart some energy, you give some energy on, on in the water of the pond, and that creates that wave. And wave carries away that energy. Similarly, uh, the energy that is coming to your eyes that is being carried away, that is being carried by the waves, electromagnetic waves. That is, and these waves are ripples in the electromagnetic field. Harris asking. Energy is released during many cosmic events. In what forms is it released and is it feasible enough to capture those and use it? Of course, so we use it. We are, uh, we exist because of these energies. If there are no sun, then we will not exist. So all the sunlight are this uh, energy uh, that uh, we get and we live, we are get all our energy from essentially from sunlight. So we are using it. Ram Kumar asks, so how a single ray of light can carry the energy? There is no single ray of light. So there is a wave. So there is a subject called geometric optics in which light propagation is kind of uh, modeled as ray a single line but that's only for the purpose of study to understand the overall thing but in reality it's not a single ray it's the wave like you see a uh, throw a uh, stone in the pond and you see waves similarly the wave propagates in the electromagnetic field Ramkumar asks again is it due to this reason that we call it as bundle of rays and not a single ray Bundle of ray is also uh, some kind of approximation. So when we say that a single ray is impossible, it's just for academic purpose, we call a bundle of ray. But in that bundle, there has to be a, a infinite rays. So it's, these are all academic purpose. Actually, it's the electromagnetic field, which is everywhere, and there are ripples in it. Gaurav is asking, uh, where the energy is given to the electric and magnetic fields. And uh, we know that for all other objects, we give the energy, but how does light get so much, so much enormous amount of energy and it travels at such a large speed? So light in vacuum travels with a very fixed speed and that speed does not change. So that's the current theory. So why it travels with large speed, that, that speed, we do not know. And where it gets, uh, uh, what is the question from where the energy is given to the electric and magnetic field. So that comes from the source, of course. 
So for example, the uh, sun, sun is emitting light because there is nuclear fusion happening at the center core of the sun. And that energy is coming out. And that energy is essentially comes to us in the form of electromagnetic waves. Aditya Arab asks, do neutron stars evaporate as they radiate energy like black holes due, do due to Hawking radiation? No, no. So Hawking radiation is something for black hole. And that also affects essentially the very uh, small black holes. For larger black holes, it doesn't matter. So uh, Hawking radiation is, uh, so uh, for black hole, the matter is hidden behind an event horizon and nothing, not even light can come from the Hawking radiation and uh, from the black hole. So black hole, it is expected would remain the same. It would not evaporate. But Hawking modeled it in this way that there is something called vacuum, which is a zero energy of our universe. And from that vacuum, continuously positive and negative particles are created and they merge with each other and destroy it again into vacuum energy. So if that happened, this particle creation happened very close to the black hole, then one part of the one particle if it goes into the black hole and other parts uh, escape, then that particle which moves into the particle, if it has uh, so-called uh, negative energy, then that decreases the mass of the black hole. And that's the way black hole evaporates. So that is a theory so far. Uh, we have not uh, seen any uh, observational evidence of Hawking radiation so far. So far it's a theory. And also it is for a very small black holes for larger black holes it would not matter and for neutron star of course uh, it's a it has a hard surface so there is no question of uh, going into the event horizon as such a neutron star anyway radiates so uh, no hawking radiation is radi required for that uh, aditya asks so neutron stars are stable enough to live forever if neutron stars are left alone then uh, they should uh, leave yes they should leave yes okay sir i have another question uh, we know that earth and all the other planets orbit in an ellipse around the sun but my question is that what which law ensures that uh, the whole solar system should be planar in nature why can't you know the mars have an orbit that is like at an angle to the earth and you know still an elliptic with respect to the sun that would ensure the that will like satisfy the Kepler's loss but you know it doesn't happen that way why sir it doesn't happen happen that way typically planets are coplanar that is they are almost in a plane not exactly there is some variation but they're almost in a plane and the reason for that is that's how they are created so uh, the solar system was created from a gas cloud which collapsed and that created the star central star that is the sun now as i showed the accretion disk um, i don't know do you see my uh, screen the uh, slides yes sir yes suppose uh, Here, for example. So uh, you see that a disk. Why is it a disk? Because it's the angular momentum. So basically, the gas cloud is coming, and they ultimately interact with each other, and they finally form a disk. So th they are not coming radially. So th they have huge angular momentum. And they rotate around the central uh, mass. And then basically, uh, because of various interaction between them, they finally form a disk-like structure like this around the central star, which we call the protostar. And then that matter falls onto the uh, protostar, which will become a star in due course. And then there are instability in this disk, which 
uh, uh, maybe there's some instability in this disk and the matter within the disk may collapse to become a planet. And then naturally these planets would be roughly in a plane, the plane of the disk. Thank you, sir. And uh, Gaurav still, uh, he continues, is it possible that as we know, at the speed of light, time stops and when we stop, it moves at a rate, but is there any absolute frame where time travels at a much higher speed going fast as found more than absolute frame in the universe? So this question I cannot answer and nobody can answer that way because it's a very confused question. And what is time? I, I, I would uh, <clears throat> advise you to think yourself. So there is nothing called time. What is time? Nothing. We cannot see time. There is no time. What is there is some change. We see some change and we characterize it uh, with some kind of time. A parameter we have defined, which is called time. Now, uh, we, before uh, Newton, and the time was a straightforward thing. We would uh, measure our year and months and weeks and so on, our uh, various uh, from the from the astronomical observations and newton uh, uh, kind of tried to formalize it using mathematics so he uh, used time as a parameter in mathematics and he considered it's a time that is uh, forward moving something equally spaced moving with the same space and so on so all these are hypothetical so there is nothing as i said that you don't see time what you see is the change and you try to characterize the change and rate of change with time and then einstein came in the early part of uh, last century and he said that well uh, times in various frames are moving in at various rates that's it so all these are theoretical thing involving time uh, to um, explain the observational and experimental facts so what is time doesn't come out from this. So it's a very deep philosophical question. That's why I'm not trying to go into this. And the question you have asked the way it's very confused. So uh, it cannot be answered in such a way. Uh, so I would rather say that whoever is interested in time, read some books on time and try to think more than that. Try to think about time. Where is time? What is time? So try to think it's a very deep philosophical thing. So uh, Einstein has explained that time is moving in various frames, various ways. What is mean by that? Does it mean anything? It's basically things are changing in different rates. That's it. As we pass. Sir. Yes. Sir, yes. Uh, time, I mean, uh, at the rate the events are happening. Uh, as you said, there is no time existence. The, only the events are happening. So I asked the uh, uh, if we relate the rate at which the time is, well, events is happening at some rate in the present time, if we found a frame that is more rest and absolute than our frame, then it is possible that the events may happen at in that frame at much higher speed. See, again, I am telling you that it's a deep, very deep philosophical question. You said that event happening at present time. Present time is a point. You cannot perceive any change at the present time because that is, if you call it a time, it is just one time. How do you know that something is changing at a present time? You cannot know that. So uh, we so, measure it by our by our senses. Exactly, we cannot measure the change in anything. Only the change occurs because we perceive it as our changes in our senses only. You can say that that is our subjective thing, and. Uh, science essentially discard the subjectivity. So again, I'm going into the philosophy of science. Science discards the subjectivity. So what you think and what you perceive is not a botheration of science. Science thinks that everything is going on the same uh, ways. There is some law, etc. But then when you come, when you try to understand time, you come to yourself, your self, your subjectivity, then you are discarding objectivity and then it's entirely your perception and perception of your sense 
at this moment if you call this a moment you cannot perceive any change i am coming into fully fully into philosophy uh, thank okay. you for all the i i would advise uh, you to think about it yourself it's a very yes, interesting sir. subject Yes. Thank you for all the insightful answers that you have given, sir. And Hello, sir. Uh, now we can move move on, move on to the vote of thanks. Uh, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Sudhi Bhattacharya on behalf of the Physics Club for making this time, making time for us despite his hectic schedule. It was a wonderful session, and I believe that no person here is leaving leaving this place without gaining any knowledge. Thank you very much for such an informative so session, and also for clearing the doubts of everyone present. i would also like to extend my gratitude to the head of our department dr d v shah and our faculty advisor dr k n parthak and all the faculty members of the department for their constant support and advice and lastly i would like to thank all the participants here who have joined and interacted making this session possible thank you one and all